this cloud lecture series having started in November 22 will continue through August 23. So that is the current academic year. But with this series, the Raudzongi Academy of Sinology curates lectures on archeology, span history, uh, artifacts and art in collaboration with experts and scholars, both local and abroad, uh, and including esteemed researchers, art collectors, as well as connoisseurs. Uh, my name is Adam Schwartz. I'm the Associate Director here at the Academy. Uh, today, we have the great pleasure of inviting Professor Sarah Allen to be our speaker. Uh, Professor Allen is an Emeritus Professor of Asian Studies at Dartmouth College, uh, currently a visiting scholar at the University of California at Berkeley, and a distinguished visiting professor at Tsinghua University, as well as chair of the Society for the Study of uh, Early China, and of course, the longtime editor of the journal Early China. Her books include The Heir and the Sage, Dynastic Legend in Early China, The Shape of the Turtle, Myth, Art, and Cosmos in Early China, the Way of Water and Sprouts of Virtue and Buried Ideas, Le Legends of Abdication and Ideal Government in Early Chinese Bamboo Manuscripts. Today, Professor Allen will present Snakes, Dragons, and the Watery Underworld in China's Early Bronze Age, uh, tracing the evolution of snake and snake-bodied dragon motifs from uh, Arlito to Yinxu, and explain what can be deduced about uh, cultural meaning. Um, after the presentation, there will be, a 15, there will be about 15 minutes for a question and answer. Um, I would ask the audience to please feel free to type your questions in the chat, um, and I will invite the speaker uh, once uh, the presentation is over uh, to answer the questions in the order in which she, uh, she sees fit. Uh, now let's invite Professor Allen if she's ready. Yes. Um, right. I need to share the screen. And... Uh, yes, please. Okay. This was all working nicely before I before we started. Um, my screen seems to be frozen. Okay. 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 Okay, today I'm going to talk about snakes, dragons, and a watery underworld in early China. In our, our, uh, my title is a little bit different than the published one because watery. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, let's zoom quick. Uh, okay. Uh, the the um, oh now we've lost you, Sarah. Okay, well, it seems like uh, Sarah is having some <laughs> technical problems. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, sorry about this. We, you know, we've done rehearsals and everything was working uh, just fine. And then as soon as we go live, uh, we run into some technical issues. Uh, Sarah's currently in Berkeley uh, right now. Uh, six o'clock, what is it? Uh, something like uh, six o'clock in the uh, early evening. So just give us a second and see if we can get her back on. Um, and uh, we'll resume as soon as we uh, resolve these technical issues. I'm really sorry about this.
I'm unmuted. Ah, uh, here you go. Okay. And the video is starting. Okay. Um, is, the is the screen shared? No. Okay. That must have cut off. There we go. Okay. Okay. So snakes, dragons, and the watery underworld in China's early Bronze Age. Uh, this talk is part of a book I'm currently working on called Inside of the Ancestral Spirits, Art and Religion in China's Early Bronze Age. And uh, I'm collaborating in this book with Han Ding of Henan University. And uh, so I wanted to mention that because many of the ideas that are I'm going to be talking about here uh, are his or his too. And uh, I want to give him full credit for that. So let me begin with a quote from Genesis. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it nor shall you touch it, lest you die. I, may, I bring this quote in just to say that uh, I'm going to be talking about snakes and uh, the snake imagery, and I'm going to be arguing that this is in fact, that's uh, a cognitive issue. And uh, although I'm not going to be doing any comparative study, but I just brought this up to remind you that snakes and death uh, are, part of our own culture or the European culture. Um, and uh, this, as one should expect from what I'm going to say. So the organization of my talk is that I'm going to begin with by talking about a theory that elemental fear of snakes and certain other animals is the origin of uh, what the, is called intrinsic religiosity. Then I'm going to talk about how this fits in with conceptual metaphor theory. And I will argue that snake images are a conceptual metaphor for death in the land of the dead. And that this is probably uh, cross-cultural, although I'm specifically going to be talking about how it works out in the ancient Chinese tradition. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about Chinese cosmology and the conception of life after death in China and argue uh, that there are two afterworlds, the sky and heaven, and a watery afterworld known later as the Yellow Springs, and that snakes are associated with the Yellow Springs. Now, this may be seem obvious to anyone who does work uh, in, in later periods from uh, the Warren States on, but it's not obvious if you're talking about the early Bronze Age. So I, I want to establish that this idea uh, uh, actually was present already uh, in the early Bronze Age. Uh, and uh, so I will be using it as a reference point. The, then I will talk about the development of snake and snake bodied motifs uh, from Shanxi Shangfan Tao Si. Uh, the dates are 2300 to 1900 BCE to the Yinshu period of the Shang Dynasty. And I will there argue that snakes and dragons are associated with water in the underworld, that we'll see that there are two types of snakes. One has a banded back and the other has a diamond back. And then dragons, which are essentially snake bodies with animal-like heads, we'll see that they start in this early period. And then in the ancient period, they acquire rooster legs and um, finally uh, talk about snake bird dualism, uh, how they reflect the myth and cosmology. Okay, let's start with Balaji Munker's uh, theory of intrinsic reli religiosity. Munker is a, is a um, biologist uh, who's an anthropologist. And uh, so he's 
worked uh, on the biology of this theory. So that's, that's important to understand. Uh, so what he argues is that in evolution, elemental fear is an adaptive neurophysical, neurophysiological response. And I'm hoping I'm getting notices that Zoom is quitting, that it's not really quitting. Um, uh, Sarah, I think you need to un <coughs> unmute your microphone. <laughs> Okay. Oh, can you go. hear me? Yes. Okay. And can you see my screen? No. Why don't you just try to restart it if you can? Okay. Okay. Looks like we're on again. We're on. Okay, so this that element that elemental fear is an adaptive neurophysiological response. Uh, this is not just true of humans. Everything but from bugs to all animals up to us uh, has this uh, response of fear to certain conditions. Otherwise, we would all be dead, or or the species would go, become extinct. But humans and other primates, that's apes, uh, respond with elemental fear to certain animals, especially snakes, large felids, that's tigers, lions, jaguars, and raptorial birds, eagles, and hawks. But uh, snakes have especially strong uh, with a physiological response uh, at the sight of them. Therefore, these animals loom powerfully in mental imageries and play a role in art, myth, and religion throughout the world. So in other words, when we see a snake, we have a physiological reaction, and uh, everyone has this, as well as apes. Munker argues that religious awe and reverence result from the sublimation of uncontrolled fear and stress. So that intrinsic religiosity is a state of mind incited by fear of forces uh, in nature that demand placation. Now, I don't know that Munker's theory of intrinsic religiosity is uh, sufficient to be the theory of the origin of religiosity or religion, as he argues. Nevertheless, uh, anyone who's familiar with oracle bones uh, of the Shang Dynasty uh, will be aware of the powerful sense of fear that the oracle bones portray. There are about the harms that are about to befall the, the Shang at any point in time. Um, but this doesn't really affect our argument one way or the other. Now, um, I am, because I'm going to talk about this in terms of conceptual metaphor theory. Conceptual metaphor theory argues that some metaphors are physiologically determined, what they call embodied, and therefore they are cross-cultural. Uh, this starts with George Lakoff and Mark Johnson and their student, uh, Grady. Um, so if this is true, then if higher primates, including humans, have a neuro neurophysiological reaction of elemental fear to the sight of snakes, as Munker argues, then we should expect there to be embodied metaphors. Embodied metaphors are things that where, where humans react in the same way, for example, uh, and therefore they're cross-cultural. For example, up and down uh, mean happiness and sadness, across the world, and this is to do with the human, physio human physiology. They've particularly concentrated on human physiology and contemporary world and things like that. Uh, but uh, there's 
what I'm arguing here is that uh, this, this, this argument should be extended to reactions that people have, uh, all people have to, to uh, animals or other, other uh, such uh, triggers. And uh, so more specifically, I'm going to argue that the images in ancient China of snakes or a conceptual metaphor that refers to snakes, it refers to death and the Yellow Springs. So in order to talk about this, we need to talk about the cosmology uh, in which people think about death uh, in order to understand the imagery. So in ancient China, there's a dualism uh, in cosmology of above and below. And that includes the sky above and water below. In fact, a dualism of sky above and water below as uh, two different afterworlds or two different parts of the world uh, is quite common cross-culturally, more common uh, actually than the dualism of sky and fire that we have, where we have heaven and hell and think of fire underneath. And it's occurred to me that possibly, we, we know that there's water underground. So it's much more a natural idea. You dig underground and you get water. Uh, and fire is less natural, but perhaps it's a result of volcanic activity. Uh, so the conception of the afterworlds in ancient China corresponds to this cosmology. So you have two afterworlds, one in the sky and one beneath. Now, these are not alternatives like heaven and hell. You don't go to one or go to the other. Everyone first goes to the Yellow Springs and potentially goes to the sky. Uh, and I think that almost everyone went to the sky if they're getting and stayed, if they're getting uh, the sacrifices that they need to, to go there, or if their bodies are not mutilated or something like that. In any case, uh, as I understand it, the material body stays in the Yellow Springs and the ethereal spirit rises. Now, there's various kinds of evidence for this. Uh, one is archaeological and oracle bone inscriptions. Um, and the, one of the most important pieces of evidence, I think, is that there are two forms of ancestral rites. Uh, and the important thing is to think of this as two different places. Uh, and and I, as I understand it, you have a material body and an ethereal spirit. So ancestral spirit. The ancestral rites include burial rites and offerings that are made at the tomb soon after death. But then there are also rites that are performed after death in ancestral tombs or other places, and those presumably go on into the future. So you see this clearly in oracle bone inscriptions, uh, and um, it's implicit, I think, also in, in earlier uh, uh, Bronze Age uh, sites. So these two different rites would seem to correspond to the two aspects of the person. One is the material person, and then the other is his the ethereal. And it's this ethereal spirit that is the, the continual ancestral cult. So when people continue offerings uh, after uh, at least a morning period, it's to that spirit that's gone to the sky. But first they go to the Yellow Springs, and it's the Yellow Springs that we're interested in here. Now, uh, how do we know that the Yellow Springs existed uh, in early times, aside from having these two different forms of, of rites? Uh, in the late Qiang dynasty, at least, in the ancient period, uh, Yue Hongbin did a fascinating study in which he measured the depth of the royal tombs at Yinshu, and uh, also measured the water level in water wells uh, that were contemporaneous with these tombs, also in Yinshu, and discovered that they were at the same level. In other words, when they built the royal tombs at Anyang, they specifically 
designed them so that the base of the tomb is the same as the water level. So they're just at the point where the yellow springs are beneath you. And this is uh, the Yao Kung, where the dogs or, or sometimes humans were buried, uh, are the entrance to the yellow springs. Uh, this seems to be good evidence that at least uh, in the Yinshu period of the Shang Dynasty, people uh, already had an idea of the Yellow Springs as a world uh, in which, as, as an afterworld, which you went to in which when you were first buried. Now, uh, there's considerable literary evidence for belief in the Yellow Springs. Um, in the Zhuozhan, we have the story uh, that Zhuang Gong swears to his mother that he, he, he will not see her until they meet in the Yellow Springs. Uh, and then, um, interestingly, uh, he's advised that if you dig until you reach the Yellow Springs and make a tunnel and meet with one another, who could say that it's not so that you didn't, that you're about, that you are violating your vow. Now, that also shows that the water beneath the ground actually is the Yellow Springs. In Mencius, we have um, worms eating soil above and drinking from the Yellow, Yellow Springs, Shaiyin uh, Fangquan. And in Zhuangzi, and that also is found in Xuanzi. And in Zhuangzi, you have um, the perfected person who glimpses the azure sky above and dives into the Yellow Springs below. And there you see then the sky and the Yellow Springs are uh, shown in a dualistic relationship. You also have this pictorially. Uh, the you don't the the difficulty when one discusses uh, art motifs of the Neolithic and early Bronze Age is that, or Bronze Age in general, is that they don't depict um, things, uh, even imaginary things. They use image metaphors to convey meaning but then nothing is actually pictorial. And so when one interprets them, you don't have, uh, you, you don't have representations, direct representations of, of real objects that, 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 that you can use. You, you have references to animals and, and, and we'll talk to you if there are snakes and such, but uh, it's different than, than later representation art. So here you have uh, a dragon and it's got a fish, so you know this is a, a tomb and a painting from uh, Zidanku, a Chu, a Chu tomb uh, excavated uh, in the early 20th century. And this is presumably uh, the tomb owner, and he's riding this dragon, and he's rising up, whether he's meant to be riding the dragon or he's rising up, you don't know, but you see a bird here too. And I take this as that he's in the Yellow Springs and he's on his way. Uh, he will eventually separate uh, from his corpse, from his material body to rise up to sky heaven. Uh, the same type of image is seen in at uh, or type of organization is seen in at Ma Wang Dui. Uh, and this, and there's several of these silk banners. This is the one for tomb one at Ma Wang Dui. And it's divided into stages, which I'm gonna, we're gonna look at a little bit more carefully. Now it's true, we're at 200 BC, and this is a rather different, we can't expect it to be exactly the same as, as things were a thousand or 2000 years earlier. Nevertheless, uh, some conceptions, uh, like the very the, the fact of an underworld and as a way that place that you go first and then the sky is a place that you go later um, is already it can is something that one can expect might be continuous. So here is the Yellow Springs, uh, and this is the underworld. We're going to look at this specifically in a minute, and th this is the lady that's buried in the tomb, and these are her attendants by her, 
And then you'll see her up here again. So this is the sky region. So it's got all three regions. Uh, and here she's flying up and here she is at the top. So if we look at this more specifically, we can see that these are the fish. These are turtles and they have, uh, I wanted to mention this because I'll mention owls again, uh, because owls are associated with the night and they're also associated uh, with death in the underworld. Uh, and they so they appear here actually in the underworld. And here you have a scene on the right here in which um, there's the feast. This is her here. And these, this is this is the feast. Now, most scholars have interpreted this type of a scene as a funeral feast. I suggest that it's not a funeral feast, but a feast that would have actually have taken, conceptually would have taken place uh, after burial in the tomb. These are the food that was buried in the tomb with her. Uh, in this period, you have figurines. In the Shang period, you have actual death attendants buried. Um, but these these are presumably some sort of attendants, perhaps those that are buried as figurines. But here she is here. And then uh, when she goes up at the very top here, she has a snake, a, this, there's this snake-like thing coiled there. It doesn't have a head. So what I think is happening here metaphorically is she's fluffing off her skin. So the a metaphor is made between uh, when one one's ethereal body uh, rises to the sky, it's like sloughing off a snake skin. And that's one of the aspects of snakes besides the um, intrinsic fear that they trigger uh, that that's metaphorically important in this Chinese conception. In fact, snakes have several several uh, characteristics that are interesting. One is, of course, that they may kill people. Uh, the other is that it, their sinuous movement. And it's this movement that people see and causes this um, physiological reaction. They burrow underground, so they're associated with the underground, they shed their skins, and uh, that's the metaphor I just referred to. They also have common genetic mutations of two heads or two bodies, and they have forked tongues. Uh, the forked tongue seems to be metaphorically less important in China than it is uh, in the West. So we'll, I'm going to start by uh, at Shangfen uh, Tao Si. Uh, this is a site that was very important. Uh, uh, it's just on the verge of Bronze Age. So it's got some early metal, but it's not, but Arli, Yinchur Arlito is where the bronze casting uh, really first developed, although there's some uh, proto, you can consider it a proto-bronze age. Uh, but it was very influential in many different re respects on the central plains at Yinchur Arlito and cultures that, that developed there. So we're going to look at the snakes there, and we'll see that these that, that, that this motif uh, has a later influence. We'll see that they're cold in water basins, and we'll see that they have a shield pattern on their back uh, that I'll, I equate with bands, many forked tongues, double body round eyes. So here are the, um, this is a water basin, uh, and here you have this snake here. Uh, you can see it's got a double body, and it's got a multi pronged tongue. Um, I say it's a double body. It could be split open because sometimes they do show split open images in this early art. I think it's a double body though because these things are not aligned with one another. The, this sort of shield pattern. I take this shield pattern as it's usually called, called as a, a conceptualization of bands on the snake. So the snake body is curved. And so that's what they're trying to show there. Now, the identity of the snake is not clear, but um, it could be a banded crate, which is a, 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 a jinghansha, which is a very venomous snake. 
The problem with identifying this snake as opposed to the diamondback snake I'm going to talk about in a minute is that there are, in fact, a lot of banded snakes. Um, this is another snake image uh, from... Uh, this is from Dadienza, which is a site that's contemporaneous uh, with Arlito and influenced Arlito. And it has uh, two eyes and has, uh, you can see mul multiple bodies. I put that there just to show that there can be snakes with multiple bodies. So um, it got out of order, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the Talsa snake, and this is another Talsa snake. This Talsa snake is the, the shield pattern has become abstracted, so it becomes like, like this. So even if this one was double bodied here, it, it becomes an abstracted pattern of this double shield pattern. Both now, remember these are water basins. So the fact that they're water basins suggests that the snake is being associated with water. What the multi forked snake tongue meant, no idea. This is back to Dadienza, where you see the same pattern on the on the lid of this. And so this is, you can see that this is influenced by these Talsa uh, style double shield pattern. Um, at Arlito, the, the, the snakes all have diamond backs. There are no snakes that have this double shield pattern on their back. On the other hand, at Yentra Arlito, which is the earliest, is where uh, Chinese bronze culture developed and is often called the um, Xia Dynasty. Although um, there's no writings or no way of making the identification, uh, uh, being certain of the identification. But it is, um, this shield pattern, you can see it best on the uh, here, as opposed to the turquoise. It's turquoise inlaid. These are these plaques were probably worn on the arm, uh, and they have a bronze background and turquoise inlaid, and they have this same double shield pattern that you see here. And this here is probably um, related to this tongue. So you see a relationship, there is a relationship with Tao Su, but a different type of snake uh, becomes dominant at Arlito. These snakes at Arlito are diamond backed, they have human eyes, a heart shaped nose, and they may have a diamond shape on the forehead, and uh, they often also may have an animal head, in which case we define them as a lung or a dragon. Uh, here we see some incised pottery from Yinshar Arlito, and you can see what these characteristics that I was just referring to. This has got a, a turtle here. This is a fragment of a pottery shard. It's got a turtle, so you see again, we're, we've got basins with water. It's regarded as a water animal. And you see these two human-shaped eyes and this heart-shaped nose and a diamond pattern on the forehead. And this is another shard and it has diamonds on the back. They're not a great many examples. In fact, they're not many figurative things from uh, Yentra Arito at all. Now this snake I think is more clearly identifiable as uh, a pit viper uh, that's known in Chinese as a, a wubusha or a baibusha. And the reason it has that name is that it's thought that if you are bitten by one of these snakes, uh, you can you will either die within five, taking five steps after you've been bitten by it, or you'll die by the time you take 100 steps. And so it's a highly venomous snake. It has a diamond back. It's sometimes described as having lateral triangles on the side, but from you can see that that results in having a diamond back. 
it has a very unusually sh usual shaped head. So it's got a big triangular head and it's got a nose that tips up. Also, it's a pit viper and pit vipers, you cannot see it very clearly, but they have a pit here. So uh, if you see this kind of nose here, you see you've got th this nose, which becomes the conventional way of depicting a snake nose uh, through the Chang Dynasty. Uh, it has these indentations here, as well as being triangular at the end. And I'm arguing that that's one evidence that, uh, as well as having um, these diamond backs, is one ev is evidence that this is a snake that they probably had in mind. Uh, but they're not realistic snakes, even if they don't have an animal head, because they are always given these eyes, uh, which are human shaped. So, and uh, often it has this triangle here. So you, you, you have a creature that is a snake, uh, but it's more than a snake. The human eyes and the diamond uh, may indicate that it has some sort of uh, supernatural or spiritual quality. Human eye motifs at Arito are, are found in other contexts. You see these here. This is the kind of shape it has. Uh, this is a so-called Bingxing Chi, a jade. Uh, the purpose of these is disputed, uh, but and you also have these. These, these are less important because they may actually be um, proto-characters and proto-writing some sort of symbol. Uh, and another shard from Arli Po, you see the same kind of snake head with the human eyes and um, triangle. And in fact, and uh, a diamond back. I think that, I mean, not triangle, I mean diamond shape on the forehead. The diamond shape on the forehead continues uh, and it's found on the Tautia and a lot of other animals through the Shang dynasty. I have, I even asked um, um, a biologist who specialized in snakes if there were any snakes that have diamonds on their foreheads, and uh, there don't do not appear to be. It could come from the diamond back, uh, but it appears to be a signifier of something super, supernatural or, or um, magical. It already appeared, in fact, at Dadienza. Uh, or not already, Dadienza is, is, a, is essentially contemporary uh, with Shang, but it has, with the with Arlito, but because it has painted pottery, uh, we have meant much more visual material to work with. And on the painted pottery you found at Dadienza, you also have these um, diamond, diamond shapes and these human shaped eyes. Dadienza is very closely related to Arlito. It's contemporaneous with it. And uh, some of the people there apparently came from the Central Plains. Uh, so you hear you, this is, you, you see that this diamond shape becomes as uh, uh, used in, in many, many different contexts uh, on into the Bronze Age. One of the things I'm trying to also establish with this is to establish that um, discussing continuity as with the Yellow Springs uh, is, not, um, is not unexpected considering the continuity that one has in these visual motifs generally. At Yentra Arlito, one also finds uh, a uh, turquoise inlaid dragon. This one doesn't have a bronze backing, it has an organic backing. Uh, and it's found placed over the corpse here. This is a corpse. Uh, and you can see this is the way, this is a, a bronze clapper bell. And this is a reconstruction here. Uh, and you can see the diamond back on it. And it does also have human eyes, although it doesn't have a diamond on the forehead. Interestingly, uh, this is the reconstruction of the head of that dragon. Uh, 
And this is a shard, a rubbing of a shard and a drawing of a shard from an earlier site in the same region, south of Mount Song rather than north of Mount Song, but also in the same region of Hunan. And it has exactly the same image, including this here, which suggests that this uh, dragon image uh, was quite long lived and also very specific. In other words, this looks like it's copying something that was made, not, it's not imaginary creature, it's copying uh, something that was made with these kind of tubes for the nose. Uh, other snake images at Yenchirarito include uh, these two. They're probably, they're pottery, but they don't have a bottom. And what their purpose is, is not at all clear, but they also have these diamond backs. Uh, the heads of the snakes are not the real ones. They were knocked off. Uh, but this other one also has a diamond back. So at Arlito, you have diamond back snakes uh, as opposed to the banded ones that you had at Talsa, but the banded snake, the band motif appears on these uh, turquoise inlaid bronzes. So from later on, we're going to see that both types of snakes uh, coexist. This is the final example of a snake at the Inter Arlito. It's a very skinny snake in a water basin or a shard of water. Of, whoops. Uh, a water basin that's got this piece missing, but um, it, it also again shows that snakes and dragons are associated with water and underworld, which is the point that I'm trying to make with all of this. Now, when we get go to the Arligang period of the Shang Dynasty, uh, there are there's relatively little material. There are a number of Taotie in the uh, Taotie begin to decorate bronzes in the Arligang period. In, in the Arlito period, the bronzes are not decorated. In the Arligang period, bronzes begin to be decorated, and they're decorated uh, almost universally with an early form of the Taotie. That form of the Taotie uh, develops bodies which uh, become snake bodies, but it's not clear from the bronzes themselves, so we won't look at those. Of particular interest, uh, looking at snakes here again, is this shard. This is a mirror image. It was first mirrored um, uh, by two Chinese scholars who, who noticed that uh, the there was enough of it to see that it was a mirror image and to present it as a mirror image. And this uh, I made myself, which was to actually put the, to, to use the shard to mirror it on a computer so you could see it really, it really fits together. It really is a mirror image. Uh, and so what you have then are two snakes with forked tongues and human eyes who are lapping at the head of this person, human head, he's smiling, and he has a double body, and the double body is in this strange posture uh, with his hands turned in. You would think that he's crawling, but his hands are turned in, so he uh, is couldn't be crawling. So if you turn it up, you see that he's like looks like this, and um, I should, yeah, he, he looks like this. So I should say here that uh, I, I'm not discussing this in any detail. I've discussed it before. And then what I've argued is that this figure is in fact a shaman entering into the other world, or, or I would say a spirit medium rather than a shaman. The other depiction of a snake that one finds uh, at in the Arligang period at Zhengzhou Shanshong Chao another um, early Shang site, is this on a architectural uh, fitting. And here's, it's got a tautia on the front uh, with human eyes and this 
uh, diamond shape. But on the sides here, you find a person who is in this same position as the ones we just saw, but he's, uh, he's actually got his head down. His eyes are like in the character Chen in Oracle Bone Inscriptions, uh, but his body is in the same way. And so uh, it, it's the same motif. And here we've got a diamondback dragon with a, the heart-shaped nose and human eyes. And here we've got a, a tiger. Uh, and tigers uh, in this period uh, become associated with, in my opinion, at least entry to the other world. Uh, the place that one sees the same, this same position occupy, uh, taken in, in the Shang period uh, are, is on these jade uh, artifacts. This one is from Xingan in the, in, in, in the south, in Jiangxi. Uh, it has very clear, what I would say is a rooster crest and human eyes, and you can see he's winged. Uh, these are three are from the Fuha tomb, and you can see they all have crests or, or cock combs, uh, and they, some of them are more or less birds. So this I've argued, uh, these, these I, I've argued, uh, are signifiers of, of the flight to the other world of, of spirit, spirit mediums. Now, in the Inshu period, um, in fact, roosters become important. Chickens were domesticated about, well, when, Chickens were domesticated, it's not entirely clear, but we know that they were domesticated in the early Inshu period. So some people say they were domesticated around 1400 BC. Some people think it was earlier. It's hard to tell because the Gallus Gallus, the red jungle fowl, in its original state, it, they still exist. And there were also domesticated, ch uh, domesticated chickens. And at, at Inshu, they actually raised uh, chickens. So, so chickens become quite important uh, in this period, and they begin to appear in the bronze art. So one of the things about roosters, besides their cock, is that they have these unusual legs with this appendage here. It's not just roosters, also pheasants and uh, peacocks have the same thing. And so this these, this type of leg starts to occur on the on snake bodies, either in the Tautia or on dragons. And uh, it's like this leg here. So if you look at uh, Tautia here, this is a this uh, this is a bronze from the Wuding period, the Inji period, and you've got a split form. You've got these legs here with the appendage. Uh, here you just have a tautia with a snake-like body. So essentially what happens is the tautia gradually, its body becomes defined into a snake, and then these bird legs are added. So at the same time that the bird legs are added there, birds begin to appear in the art. So one gets a clear uh, dualism between the sky above and with birds and snakes below. Here you see these standing birds uh, on the top of, uh, of this fanghu, and um, this is the same vessel, and here you see uh, a leg, diamond-shaped, double-bodied dragon figure. Uh, below you have a tautia that also has legs, and this would be the appendage on the leg. So what happens then in the so uh, in the Neolithic period and at Arlito uh, to then we're having uh, references to the Yellow Springs, 
Uh, but now we begin to get a more complex iconography in which you have references not only to the Yellow Springs, but also to tin to the sky above with the birds and with animals that are half bird, part bird and part snake. Uh, another aspect of, of, uh, of roosters is that cocks crow up the sun, and this may well be uh, associated with the sun myth uh, that I've argued uh, was uh, an, an integral, integral part of the way that the Chang rulers identified themselves with the Ten Suns. Uh, I won't go into that, I've, I've written about it before, but uh, an important aspect of that is that there were ponds um, beneath the trees in the east and the west where the suns rose and set. So essentially then you get, um, this, if the suns were birds, they fly across the sky as birds, and then they have to go, they enter into a pond and should go back through the Yellow Springs to enter up the other side. So they should be uh, dragons when they go through the Yellow Springs. So the legged snake uh, seems to encompass both this flying aspect and this um, uh, swimming aspect of the snake below. Uh, so we've seen already that Pan had uh, uh, snakes in them, and then we'll see that in, in the this has developed in the Inchi period where Pan are decorated like ponds. Uh, they and um, that is to say they're an entrance entrance to the Yellow Springs. That doesn't necessarily mean they're those ponds. They uh, any pond can be an entrance to the Yellow Springs. Uh, they conventionally have snakes dragons or turtles in the center. Um, and you can tell that they're uh, associated with water by the other water creatures and birds. Now, what I think is happening here is that the pond which were used for uh, as water vessels were, there were water vessels for ritual cleansing. So that is to say before that someone made an offering to an ancestral spirit, he would wash himself with this water in a pond. Uh, so the cleansing with this water uh, would have enabled him then to contact the ancestral spirits or to make his offerings available to the ancestral spirits. So the pond then uh, served this transitional, transitional uh, role uh, in the uh, ritual offerings to the ancestral spirits. Uh, so some of these uh, have dragons with diamond shapes, and then you see here you've got a bird and a fish. These are probably tigers. Uh, they they also have this kind of stripe pattern. Um, and but so you've got then all three tiers. You've got this tier. The tigers are also considered an entry to to another world. And here we have this shield pattern on a snake, on a dragon or snake. So this is also, uh, and the same types of animals around the snake. So both of these um, snake forms that we saw uh, beginning in, uh, in the late Neolithic, early Bronze Age uh, are associated with water and water vessels all through this period. In this case, uh, the pond idea is, is, is also shown by putting the birds uh, in, in standing birds around the edge. And here you have a turtle. And I put this one in to show that it's not just dragons that they're associated with. The ponds are so the, the, these pond vessels are associated with uh, Pond of water, uh, irregardless of whether it's a turtle or uh, a snake or dragon. And you can see he also has this diamond on his forehead. Uh, the 
Snakes or dragons are also found on the bottom of vessels, further evidence that they're associated with beneath the ground. Uh, and here you see a, if these are owls, this is an owl motif. And I put this in because we saw early on, we saw owls in the underground, under, underworld when we saw the Mawangdwe uh, banner. And uh, here we have owls with, this one's missing its head, but you see a snake uh, around the wing and you see another snake around the wing here. Uh, this one is diamond shaped and this one is shield shaped. This is a marble um, architectural fitting, I think, uh, from Inshu uh, to 1001. Um, and also, again, it's a combination of animals. Uh, but we've got the, these continuous um, association of snakes with the underworld. So uh, what I've been uh, attempting to show is that snake and dragon motifs in the art of China's early Bronze Age were image metaphors that referred to death and the watery underworld. In order to do that, though, I needed, I, I uh, attempted to establish that um, snakes intrinsic, first of all, snakes intrinsically are associated with death. And uh, probably universally function as image metaphors for death or the underworld. I then uh, went on to argue that in the ancient Chinese cosmos, you have two underworlds. Uh, one is, a, is an underworld underground that's associated with water. The other, of course, is the sky. That this cosmology uh, probably goes back at least uh, to the third millennium BCE uh, and continues on from then that. So the structure, uh, uh, the structure is, is valid even when you're looking at the early period, but is continuous. Um, then we saw that the snake and dragon motifs, uh, dragons essentially being snakes with animal-like heads, uh, so they have snake-like features, uh, they are associated specifically with uh, the Yellow Springs or the underworld, uh, and then uh, they become a so they become a dual figure that also has bird legs and can fly as well as um, uh, function in the underground. So, thank you. Uh, okay, um, thank you very much, Professor Allen, for a um, a brilliant talk. Um, I don't see anything in the in the chat uh, we'll give uh, the listeners a, a minute or two to type something in if they have one um sarah could you if i could just start could you just talk a little bit about this book project that you have going on and and uh, i don't know just um how is that uh is it is it more along the lines of because in sight of ancestral spirits it includes the research that has been presented today Yes, yeah. So this is a chapter of that book, and and essentially, it's about Chinese art in the early Bronze Age. So through the Shang Dynasty, uh, and although it's in the early Bronze Age, you have to go back to the Neolithic to get to the to the early Bronze Age. So the focus will be on on Yinchuan Arito and the Shang period. Um, the difficulty, of course, is that you have all so many different kinds of evidence uh, and um, and a long period that you're dealing with. So what essentially I'm trying to do is to take a multidisciplinary approach and uh, then uh, look at um, sets of motifs as they develop 
and then there's overlapping. Um, they overlap so that your the evidence builds up in a way that you can't necessarily see from just looking at one motif through through this period of time. So, in other words, my con conception that I've been trying to that I, I pointed to here about what happens after you die, um, you there there will be more evidence. But the problem is that if you're going to interpret these motifs and you see that these are your it's argument, my argument is that you have to see them in the context in which they worked. That context is burial. So they're mortuary objects. And so it's uh you have to think about what happened with people to people after they died. How did they think about death and how did they see the cosmos? And then you can begin to understand the, icon the logic of the iconography in those terms. Um, so Handing and I have been working on it for quite a number of years, but we're, we're getting there, I should say. <laughs> I hope it won't be too much longer. <laughs> okay, well, we eagerly await. I see a couple of... Um, could you open up the chat, um, Sarah, and just see uh, there's a question. Uh, I think there's two questions. And choose which one. Okay, like I have one here from Maswin. Yeah. Um, oh, and then there's one that was just direct message to me. Let me just uh, copy it and put it back to you. Okay, so I'll okay. just answer this one while you're doing that. Yes, I, I've gone ahead and done that. But go ahead and just, if you would, you okay. could choose which which you'd like to respond. Well, it says, what are my readings of, of the motifs on the other other two plaques? It's right mouse, what is acting, asking. Um, I I think that that's that they're not re they're not related to snakes. Let's put it that way. So um, I I think that's too complicated to go into here. I would have to put them into to to, to do another context. Um, the bodies of the other ones are related to I think motifs uh, found. Uh, at Dadienza, but they're more abstract. Um, I, that's all I can say about that one. I, I hope it's enough. <laughs> um, the next question is, did snakes also refer, refer to fertility in early Bronze Age? We know that the snake-bodied new one, Fushi, have the meaning of fertility. Um, I can't see it. So one of the difficulties that one has here is that um, you don't, I'm dealing with the motifs of the central planes. Uh, and the central planes don't encompass anything, everything. So um, if the Nuan Fushi. If the reason that Nuan Fushi are associated with fertility has to do with their being snake bodied, uh, then it would probably have another origin. It's not, there's nothing associated with snakes per se uh, that I can see would associate them with fertility. On the other hand, Fushi and Yuwa are, are supposed to have designed the world, and so therefore they began people. But um, I don't, I think that their origins are probably regional and not central plains. Okay. Let's see if we have. I don't see anything else. Uh, while we're waiting, Sarah, can I just ask you, have you given any thought to, I know your um, the paper here has been mostly concerned with motifs. Um, have you given any thought to, because I know, you know, obviously you work intensely with oracle bone inscriptions too. Have you given any thought to how snakes are portrayed uh, at least graphically in the language, I was just thinking. I, yeah, yes, I, I have. I have actually worked on that, and and uh, <laughs> I, it's very complicated. Yeah, 
uh, but the, the, one of the reasons it's complicated is because um, the what what is a graphic representation of a snake and what is a graphic representation of a chong? Absolutely, yeah. It is argued. Yeah. On the other hand, chong are also, also include snakes. We translate chong into English as insects. Uh, so the other issue is that the variant that's taken at to mean chong has a pointed nose. Mm. And I think that that means it's this uh, pit viper that I was talking about. So it should be a snake. And, and therefore, and that it's just a variant of, of the more elaborate, elaborate form. Um, but in order to show that, I would have to write a Jagawan paper. <laughs> On the other hand, you do find, if you accept, accept that those are snakes, you find a foot over a snake right. is a word that means harm. Right. So that comes into this whole idea as snakes being associated with death and the land of the dead. These are curses. Uh, that, that character is pronounced high or yep. supposedly pronounced high. Uh, it doesn't exist in later in later writing. So uh, snakes are used in words that have to do with cursing. There's also find in, in, in Sha itself to kill. Uh, so um, it fits into the oracle bone uh, uh, use of the character snake itself. And also the oracle bone idea that they're always saying, will there be no curse? Occasionally, I mean, sometimes I do say, will we get support? But you say, every 10 days, you know, there'll be all these exercises, will there be no harm to us? So this fits in, I think, with the idea of early religion being about fear of supernatural forces. I mean, the Shang kings were terribly afraid of everything. <laughs> the whole... <laughs> state was organized in order to appease the ancestral spirits and the nature spirits too but but they were they were it, it was all about fear and that fits in with the same kind of idea of, uh, of snakes and and uh, ancient religion about being trying to uh, not just sublimate, sublimate one's fears, but actually control the, the supernatural forces. Yeah. Uh, so there's one more question here, uh, Guo Hong, uh, to relationship between the dragon and I think he means Taltia here. I, I can't see it. Can you just tell me what it is? Sure. It just says how to... Uh, how do you understand the relationship between the dragon and I think he means Taltie. He wrote he wrote T O T I E, but I think it's got to be Taltie. The dragon and Taltie. Yeah. Okay, well that's an, actually an interesting issue because um, I'm have talked about the dragon as it develops from a snake. On the other hand. The evolution of the Tautia itself cannot really be separated from the from snakes, because Tautia become snake bodies before they get legs. And then they separate those forms separate off into dragons. So I see the, the dragon as having an independent origin in this snake form. And then I see the Tao Tia developing under the influence of snakes as it develops its body, and then those forms being separated off. 
if that makes sense. It's, it's complicated, but there's no way really to separate a dragon from half of a Tautia in the late Shang period. So you can separate, you can have a Tautia and then it can become two dragons. Um, but the rooster foot may well be more associated with the development of the Tautia than with the development of snakes independently. I mean, you can see the Tao Tia as, as developing from the two-bodied dragon too. So it's, or you can see, uh, there, there are various ways of seeing it, but it, they cannot be separated from one another. They influence, uh, these, these motifs are influencing one another. The same as you have these two different kinds of snakes, and then they start to, uh, uh, um, get mixed together. Hmm. Okay. Uh, do we have any other questions? We just have a couple minutes left. Uh, Sarah, can you see this a new question from Functure that just came? Well, I, I see some other, yeah, I mean, which one is it? I've, I've actually had this in the wrong position, so is it? It just came in 11.11. Do you see one? It says, um, I have a question about the geographical distribution. Oh, yeah, uh, in the Neolithic period and early yeah, China, right. you see yeah. Spanish of size, southern China. Southern yeah. China. Uh, do you see them as a different culture from the central plain? Um, This is a complex issue because these southern uh, these southern motifs influence the central plains. They don't, so they may, in some sense, they exist independently, but they also influence the central plains. So um, you could say that the snake with the shield pattern probably has a different origin than the one with the diamond pattern the way I see it. And then and then uh, they become intermingled. On the other hand, um, uh, these same motifs influence San Ching Dui, and you can say that the uh, Middle Yangtze River Valley serves as a as a um, in, it, it serves as a, as an intermediary between in, in, in both directions. I don't know if that. Uh, yeah, sorry, can I can I just ask a follow up question? Yes, please. <laughs> so, and if if we don't have textual evidence, how can we tell if these early cultures that have different geographical areas interpret the snakes um, philosophically differently? You can't. So all I can talk about, what I'm talking about, has to be the central plains. In other words, I can see that the, so I'm confining my study to talking about the central plains. The central plains is influenced by ideas clearly from many different parts of China, particularly at Arito, you see influences from all over. And in the Shang dynasty, particularly in the period between Arligang and Inshu, you see a lot of influence from the South. Now, those some things will be general. So snakes, I've argued, have certain aspects that are probably global. Uh, so snakes are probably associated with death and uh, the afterworld all over the world. They're, um, their, their conceptual metaphors or primary metaphors, but then they'll have other kinds of, of associations too. And those probably uh, are, may differ regionally. So I can't say, so 
when ideas go from the central plains go to other parts of China, they may interpret them quite differently. And when ideas go from other parts of China to the central plains, uh, they may all, they, 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 their ideas may be changed. But in order to be able to make sense of things, um, I have concentrated on the central plains. Do you see what Thank I mean? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You have to, because you have to have an internal logic. And if you want to talk about a regional logic, then you would have to talk about it, its own internal logic there too. And that would also be true if you look at San Jing Dui. So San Jing Dui has a lot of influence from the Shang, but it's not, it's also got its own independent uh, idea. So you would have to see how the ideas that come from the central plains are reinterpreted there and how the, the internal dynamic works there uh, in, in San Jing Dui, in that, in that region. Okay, um, so the time is uh, up for today. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Allen again. Um, and um, we look forward to um, seeing everybody next month on March the 23rd when we have Professor Lee Min from UCLA, who's going to be talking about um, the origins of uh, Joe society. Um, anyway, thanks very much for tuning in today and um, have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.